Oh. <laughs> So I broke this down into a uh, non-prescription or um, like kind of street things that are uh, <coughs> ingested and toxic and then prescription medications that are often intentionally or accidentally um, ingested and cause toxic side effects. And at the end, we'll just do a quick week. Um, most of the lecture is going to be on our comp or here for several reasons. A, I feel like where we are demographically, we see this most commonly. Um, however, it's as far as broad questions go, these are not asked as much as prescription toxicology questions. So a lot of questions that you see on board tend to be more beta blockers, capital blockers, but I thought this is going to be more helpful clinically um, to apply what we learn here. So the father of toxicology was meant to be is this gentleman, his name was Paracelsus. Um, he was around at the early, early, I think, 1700s. Um, and he was the first to describe, um, to, to consider things as being toxic. So poison is in everything, and nothing is without poison. The dosage is what makes something either poison or a remedy. And from this concept, um, sort of modern toxicology was birthed. And this was followed by a famous Spanish physician, Orphelia, who was around in the 1800s. He originally trained um, <coughs> France, and he was the grandfather of um, forensic toxicology, so he was the first person to find toxins in um, deceased patients, and he was significant in putting lots of people in prison around the turn of the century for um, lots of women were poisoning their husbands with arsenic and cyanide, and he was the first to be able to find this in the system and use it in a court law. So toxicology today has significantly changed. There's two large areas. One of them is mechanistic toxicology, which we are not so much involved in. This he looks at the biochemistry of the drug, how it works, how it's absorbed, how it's distributed and excreted. Um, but more relevant to us here is clinical toxicology, which is the study of various drugs and its effects on the body. And we're concerned with both treatment and prevention of drug toxicity in the population. And the science behind this now, there's actually an American college for um, clinical toxicology, looks at how people's individual genetics um, give vari various responses to toxins, as well as looking at how doses can affect uh, patients and the length of exposure. So from this is um, a clinical application that we use more today. I put this in here to Dr. Perez because it uh, made me chuckle. <laughs> Um, so alcohol, so I got a lot of data from the CDC because um, it was, it, I think it's just good to, from a broader perspective, to just look at how significant this problem is. So alcohol poisoning um, deaths, I looked at this from state to state and I feel like if you look um, sort of Midwest and West Coast has a significant um, death rate from alcohol poisoning um, and then we are, as you all know, somewhere here, so we're not doing terribly well. Um, but we're certainly not as bad as the okay. Um And then if you break that down, on average, six people a day die from alcohol poisoning in the States. Three quarters of those are particularly young, I think, so 35 to 64 years of age, and then three quarters of those are men. So your key demographic is sort of mid uh, young to middle-aged men. And then I broke that down further into the actual state of Kentucky, and I thought this was quite alarming. So deaths related to alcohol poisoning are broken down into both chronic and acute. Chronic obviously being death related to cirrhosis, secondary to alcohol. And then acute, and the population here is much younger, um, is related to most of the from driving and possibly suicide. And if you break that down, if you do on the CDC website, it's such a life loss, you're looking acutely, <coughs> Um, at over 31,000 years of life of loss, um, which I thought that was significant and it really have helped to hone in. Uh, go on. Okay, so alcohol poisoning. So poisoning by toxic alcohol, um, poisoning by alcohol causes cellular dysfunction and ultimately death. So delays in diagnosis leads to significant irreversible organ damage. And I think the thing to remember is that um, the alcohols themselves, with the exception of isopropanol, are not themselves directly toxic. It's their metabolites that go on to cause organ dysfunction, cellular death, and ultimately death of the patient. Um, and so you need to recognize these early and understand the metabolic changes that are happening to be able to appropriately treat the patients. 
So alcohol dehydrogenase is the first enzyme, if you remember way back, that catalyzes the alcohol and results in an aldehyde. But your real key enzyme is this aldehyde dehydrogenase, which goes on to break down these metabolites into the active form, which is what causes um, cell death and damage. Um, and so I don't know if you remember this from way back when, but these are all of your parent alcohols, so um, <coughs> ethylene, propylene, um, and these all get broken down into their subsequent metabolites. And this here, uh, <coughs> these active metabolites here are what cause cellular damage and death. And so lots of treatment is focused at blocking this enzyme to prevent this reaction. And as you go across here, you're getting an increase in the mammary gap. Um, and this is just um, actually really helpful Dr. Sartan and Joe about last week from the about alcohol. So this is one of the tables from there. So the parent alcohol, the most common source, which I think most of us know these, um, and then the onset of actions and the major changes. So if you look down here, they all cause an increase in osmolar gap, except it's isopropanol that does not have a metabolic acidosis that goes with it. So that's how you differentiate it from uh, that question. <coughs> so clinical features, you know, there's a depressed sensory and organ dysfunction, <coughs> increased osmolar gap. And then some of the alcohols have specific organ findings. The osmolar gap is just something that is very broad relevant. You are expected to calculate that. Um, and that what, that's what that question was just about. Um, and so a normal gap is um, 10 to 20, and anything above that is significantly elevated. Having said that, a normal osmolar gap does not exclude toxic alcohol ingestion, because the parent alcohol itself, um, if you measure it before that's broken down, you'll have a completely normal metabolic um, syndrome. There'll be nothing wrong. Um, and as it gets metabolized is when you'll see these changes. But maybe they were checking too early, um, and so you won't have any of these changes in the patient blood. So I'm going to quickly talk about methanol, which um, we find or is found in windshield washer fluid, camp stove fuel. This is the one that is associated with visual disturbances. So these patients will complain of double vision, blurred vision, and in some cases will go on to have complete blindness. If a patient comes in with visual disturbances, it's an indication for dialysis to remove this alcohol. And then other non-specific things are polyphenol toxicity. <coughs> um, in these patients, they can develop neurological symptoms days to weeks after, so that's something to always keep an eye out later developing. Um, whereas some of the other alcohols, it's much more um, sudden, the onset neurological dysfunction. And as you can see, these do have a high anion gap metabolic gap. And then I grouped this with ethylene glycol because the treatment for methanol and ethylene glycol is the same. Um, and this is the one that is found in um, antifreeze and de-icing fluids. And this uh, leads to kidney dysfunction. So um, these are the ones that get the oxalic crystals in their urine that you can see and go on to have acute kidney injury and even renal failure. It can also cause neurological and cranial nerve damage much quicker. So this develops within the first 12 hours compared to methanol. And again, it has the same metabolic <coughs> problem. Um, interestingly, in these patients, if you check a point of care lactic with a serum lactic and there's a huge discrepancy, it's another indication of ethylene glycol toxicity. And that's because uh, the isomer is a little different for the, um, there's like an L isomer and a D isomer, and the I staff doesn't pay both of those. So, treatment for alcohol poisoning. So, early recognition, a good history or an indication that they've had um, alcohol ingestion. You cannot use things like um, activated charcoal or gastric lavage in these patients because it's absorbed too quickly. Your goal is to try and correct the acidosis with bicarb, and you want to uh, increase urine excretion of the toxic uh, metabolites, and that helps to prevent deposition into the cranial nerves and the optic. You should consider treatment when the level is above 20 <coughs> milligrams per deciliter or in an osmol gap above 10. But realistically, anybody who you suspect of acute alcohol ingestion or poisoning, you need to treat. So two big treatments that we know of is the use of ethanol, which we know would act as a competitive inhibitor to push, um, sorry, for the alcohol to have organized enzyme. enzyme. Um, this, ironically, is not FDA approved, but it is very widely used. The problems with this is the patient has to be taken to the ICU. You have to monitor serum ethanol levels, and you want to try and aim for a level of around 100. That's a, the number of which it becomes a competitive inhibitor. Um, and it also only comes, um, it has to be compounded by pharmacy for IV use. 
Um, and so for that reason, it's a little bit more cumbersome. Um, <coughs> it's falling out of favor since the arrival of Tomekizol, which we now use more commonly. This is FDA approved for acute alcohol toxicity, and it's 8,000 times more potent um, as being inhibitors than um, ethanol. It's only been approved for methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity, so you cannot use it for the other alcohols. And it does not require ICE monitoring, so theoretically these patients could be given tests all on the floor. Um, you want to give a loading dose, followed by um, 10 milligrams for over 12 hours. And after 12 hours, you actually have to increase the dose because they reach sort of a steady state and they get a tolerance of methanol. You have to keep increasing. Um, most notably, this is <coughs> by dialysis. So a lot of patients who have acute alcohol toxicity, again, have acute kidney injury, and a lot of those require dialysis. And so you want to dialyze them first and then dose them on the metazole, and then dialyze them after the medication on the um, And so for that reason, patients who require dialysis, it's recommended that you use hemodialysis rather than continuous um, renal replacement therapy because then you would be continuous hemodialysis. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have done a couple of studies looking at this, and essentially, if you treat a person with a methazole, mortality, no matter what you've ingested, is improved. So it goes from 22 if you use ethanol to 17, and then from 18 down to 14, so just as you use methazole. So really, it is a good question. Um, I've put lots of doses throughout this talk um, of the medications, just because I think clinically it's helpful, um, but obviously I'm being from that. Um, and then the board of dialysis. Most of these patients will ultimately need to be dialyzed. Um, it's recommended for severe metabolic acidosis, and then for a serum concentration of above 50, that's an indication for dialysis. As I mentioned, anybody with acute renal or visual changes, because that, um, is, that's an indication for dialysis. And I already mentioned chemodialysis is um, and then if you had to just pick one treatment option, they actually recommend dialysis over everything. While Methazole has some really good literature behind it, it, it keeps that toxic metabolite in your system for longer, so it increases the half life, whereas dialysis removes it from your system altogether. Um, so you really would just have to take into account what your options are, what you have available to you as your institution. Um, and then a few other things that can be helpful is folic acid and methanol poisoning help to convert the acid into water. Um, and then ethylene glycol <coughs> with some promising results with pyridoxine and thymine, um, which just reduce the toxic metabolites. I'm going to talk very briefly about isopropanol toxicity. So this is the one that you see more in patients. So lots of cyclinists don't have rubbing alcohol and that kind of thing because um, this is where you find both isopropanol. Um, it causes all of the other symptoms, so respiratory failure, cardiopulmonary dysfunction, um, hypotension, and lactic acidosis, but this does not give you an anion gap metabolic acidosis, um, but it will give you a high osmolar gap. So I bet that's quite heavily tested, and it's just that one point that differentiates it from the other one. Um, levels above 1,500 give you a deep coma, and the prognosis is very poor. Levels above 500 are actually considered severe and high treatment. The treatment for this is relatively is thoroughly <coughs> supportive. Um, hemodialysis you can use if they're profoundly hypotensive, but they recommend against fomeprazole because it actually slows down the metabolism of this alcohol, keeps in your system longer, and worsens the side effects. Um, and then propylene glycol, I only mentioned very briefly because I've seen it on questions, and it's typically, um, which we don't do a lot of, but it's uses a dilutant for lots of inpatient IV medication, particularly for us Ativan. So if you put in an Ativan drip, it's diluted in this alcohol and they can go on to cause acute alcohol. Um, they can get uh, symptoms from that, including lactic acid and it's the same thing. So the underlying treatment will be to stop the medication, obviously, and then it's supported. These patients generally don't need the one of other um, intervention. Um, so the overall, in severe alcohol poisoning, these patients can be things that are feel stable and really should be on ICU. You want to make sure you're monitoring liver, renal, um, and electrolyte abnormalities, and you need to know what the alcohol level is. If you monitor that closely, because once it drops to 20 to 30, you can actually stop any of your therapy and then you should just recover from that. Okay, next I'm going to blast through opiates quickly, and again some really interesting figures. So um, opiate-related deaths have increased 200% since the year 2000, 
and studies show a direct correlation between the number of prescriptions now being prescribed by physicians and the number of overdoses. Um, I thought that this was quite shocking. So prescriptions have increased by 700% and by 1200% in the amount of methadone that we are now prescribing. So, and this was recently, as I'm sure you're all aware, that has become like a national epidemic or state of emergency. Um, and this is just a picture of, um, that I found of the increase of overall deaths from opiates. Um, so most recently here, there's very few places that it's not probably. Um, so to give you some context again, number of opioid prescriptions per 100 people, and unlike um, alcohol, this is where we come into our own, so we really do have a problem with opioid use um, in this part of the country. And I thought this was quite interesting, so where are these people, where are people getting their opioids from? So most commonly it's given to them by a friend or relative for free, um, is the number one cause, followed by prescriptions from more than one physician, then they're either stealing them or buying them from friends. Um, and then here, if you look at significant overdoses, again, we're right in that area where overdoses um, are a problem for us. Um, and then this was a study that came out in the Blue Journal quite recently looking at the critical care crisis. So this was a study that just looked at the ICU and um, opiates and the impacts that that was having. So it looked at um, 164 hospitals across 44 states in this timeline. And it looked at opioid-related overdoses, deaths, ICU admissions and cost. So they looked at over 4 million ICU admissions, of which 22,000 um, were opiate related, 55% female, 35% non white, 4% uninsured, and 18% were on Medicaid, um, and then 25% of those were over the age of 70. In short, it showed that every month there was a 0.5 increase for critical care needs in opiate um, ingestion that seem to be higher in summer months. However, if you are admitted in the summer, your overall mortality is better. Um, <coughs> and the death increased overall in that time frame from 7.3 7 to 9.8. Um, and that non-prescription, so heroin, was associated with much worse mortality than if you're abusing your own prescription medication. Mm. And then um, associated comorbidities, so 25% of these patients have pneumonia, 6% will have septic shock, 15% ratio, and 8% will have such significant evidence that they have an optic brain injury. And the cost, which I thought was probably a little crude, but um, staggering, is that this <coughs> has changed from 58,000 to 92,000 in this time frame. 10% <coughs> uh, of primary mechanical ventilation, that stayed about the same. And there's been an increased need for pressor and needle replacement therapy over that same time frame. So opiates essentially increase um, there's multiple opioid receptors here. They're distributed throughout the whole body. Mu is the most commonly studied and um, well known about receptor, and it's responsible for the um, suppression of pain. So, this is a little, <laughs> I threw this in just so you can understand. So, most medications undergo first order elimination, meaning that a constant fraction of the medication is metabolized, whereas um, zero order metabolism is that a constant amount of the drug is metabolized. When a patient overdoses on an opiate or takes a bigger dose than they are prescribed, the pharmacokinetics change from first to zero order metabolism, which means that a much bigger amount of the drug is being metabolized, which is what leads to their um, symptomatology. And any small increase that they then absorb leads to significant shifts in the plasma concentration and leads to their overdose um, phenomenon symptoms. So this is looking at the drugs, so for example, morphine at a therapeutic dose or an overdose dose. And then it sticks around for much longer um, if you look at all of these medications. So they're obviously safe at appropriate prescription doses, but once people take more than that, um, it sticks around for much longer and causes the problems that we see. Clinical features I think we're all very familiar with, most commonly respiratory distress and stupor. These patients can also be hypothermic and then we get associated rhabdo and uh, sepsis with these patients. So management, I'm, I feel like we're not very comfortable managing this, but a few things to be aware of. Um, they actually recommend that if your patient is breathing less than 12 breaths per minute that you should assist them with ventilation, whether that's bag mass, if capable, put them on BiPAP, um, and if obviously you need to intubate these patients. They recommend for naloxone and all of these patients, it's a competitive new receptor antagonist, and it's available IV, intranasally, and um, um, coronary route. Um, 
and it has a very quick onset and it lasts anywhere from 20 to 90 minutes if given IV. <coughs> um, so the actual dosing of naloxone is not been studied, it's very empiric. The effective dose depends on the patient, their tolerance, the amount that they took, how they metabolize it. So you really want to give this medication until you see a clinical response. But it is, uh, they, the recommendations are that you start with 0.04 and then you repeat this every two minutes with a maximum dose of 15 milligrams. And this is just um, sort of um, it's a table of this, so we would be over here for adults. And then you just check every two to three minutes on their symptoms and you go up to a maximum of 15. <coughs> Clinical pills that I didn't think everybody was aware of, including myself, is that a lot of people worry about giving the Luxon to chronic opiate users and it will cause acute withdrawals and seizures. There really no evidence to back that up. And they recommend that you give the medication anyway because all of the unwanted side effects are uncomfortable but not life-threatening. So they have increased inflammation, they become diaphoretic, um, they can have increased GI motility, but none of those are life-threatening, whereas the actual overdose is. Um, if your patient is persistently hypoxemic despite being treated for this, you want to keep their negative pressure pulmonary edema, which can be seen in these patients. Um, in patients who have an opiate overdose and have a rhabdo, give fluid, but they say to avoid bicarb in these patients. It can actually precipitate um, the overdose and keep the drug in the system, in the system for longer. Um, and your respiratory failure related to opiates is not related to the peak concentration or the initial dose. And I think we see that you can give one person one milligram and another person five, and their reaction is very different. Hmm. And so this is just an algorithm of what they are asking you to do. And the, in the interest of time, this is the most important part here. So naloxone has a very short half-life compared to the opiates it's used for, which have a longer half-life. So a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this myself, is you'll give naloxone, the patient will wake up, they'll look better, you'll say their hand on the floor, and you'll go back to the ICU and pretend the job's better. Um, but they actually recommend these patients be observed because the naloxone will uh, be metabolized and opiate will stay and they'll continue to go back to the <coughs> and and some So the minimum you should observe these patients for anywhere is four to six hours and then after that you can tell whether they should go home or to the high school. Right. Um, Benzos, I'll touch upon very, very briefly. We use these commonly. They are very frequently um, overdosed. They're one of the second most frequent medications to be overdosed. Fatalities come from respiratory failure. Um, and the risk factors are your age and your other comorbidities. And fumazanil is the um, antidote for them. Um, the biggest concern is seizures. So this is something that you need to be concerned about if you give these patients fumazanil and you reverse it. Especially if they're chronic users, they will have seizures. So I'm going to move very quickly through this, but these I feel are more tested, but we see less uh, often in the clinic. So beta blockers, as we all know, toxicity is primarily cardiac and central nervous Most commonly it's sinus bradycardia, hypotension, and the hypotension is because of decreased cardiac output. There is a second mechanism by which these cause toxicity or they work, and it's called a membrane stabilizing effect. They essentially inhibit the fast-acting sodium channels, which are um, in the heart muscle, and this therefore prolongs AV non conduction and can lead to complete heart block. Now, there are medications that we'll talk about that can reverse beta blockers from these, but you cannot reverse this. There's no antidote really for this. Um, and this is seen most commonly in protanolol, which is used less and less, uh, then metropol, and then the beta -nol. And the membrane stabilizing effect is more significant, uh, significantly contributes to the central nervous system toxicity rather than chronic toxicity. Um, so you do actually see neurotoxicity with beta blocker overdose. Um, these are lipid soluble, they do cross the blood brain bar barrier quite easily, and it's most commonly associated with propanol. So in our liver patients, that we see over a um, I'm sure you all know glucagon is one of the biggest antidotes for beta blockers. Um, and so typically, um, this it's a G-protein clothed receptor. And so typically, you get um, activation of this beta receptor, which converts ATP into cyclic AMP and allows an influx of calcium, which increases cardiac contractility and cardiac output. Um, if you block it with a beta blocker, you don't have this downward pathway, and therefore you have decreased chronic output, which is um, what it's used for. 
So glucagon acts um, in a similar way. So if you give the patient glucagon, it activates the same receptor, converting ATP to CAMP and increasing cardiac output and contractility. So that's the mechanism behind um, glucagon and why it works. Um, so like I said, because there's this membrane stabilizing effect, atropine is less effective in these blocker um, overdose. And so glucagon is the agent of choice. Mm. Indications include hypertension, severe bradycardia, and central nervous system infection. You want to give a bolus over one minute, and then you want to follow this by a continuous infusion. And these patients do need to be in a nice period. Because of glucagon being what it is, it can cause hyperglycemia from um, gluconeogenesis, and it breaks down glycogen stores. And when patients become hyperglycemic, they can become hypoalkalemic. So these are two things to keep an eye out. And then hypertensive crisis, obviously, just because of the mechanism which it work, but this is quite uncommon. But because of this mechanism, then you want to avoid it in patients who have the sexual illness. So it's contraindicated if your patient has a Other treatments, if you get to the patient in time, is gastric lavage and activate the charcoal. And then in severe cases, you want to use cardiac pacing. Um, and you can consider hemodialysis for some of these because they're protein bound, so they can be dialyzed. But the medications that we usually see in dialysis are not always functional. Calcium channel blockers. Um, <coughs> about the same. Um, so they are among the five most frequently reported um, and most lethal ingestions currently. Most commonly it's paracamil, methodopine, and diltiazam. Calcium has a profound effect as you know on smooth muscle contraction. So it has two mechanisms of action. It determines the strength of the contraction and it also propagates uh, impulses across the nose um, and that's how it works. So it has a kind of block of the Rapamil and diltiazem are most commonly associated with hypotension from a decreased cardiac output perspective, whereas nifedipine causes vasodilation and that drops through blood pressure. And to differentiate, these patients will have a reflex tachycardia and these patients will be not. So that can sometimes be a little bit of a And then other symptoms are lethargy, seizures, and hypoglycemia. Two methods of treatment, but most obviously is you want to replace the calcium. It will act as a capacitive antagonizer so that the um, will have increased calcium influx. And then again, it will act much the same way if it's going over the other receptor. It will increase the AMP, so you want something to antagonize that so that you can um, have an influx of, cardiac, of calcium. These um, patients, you want to treat them with calcium. Most, um, <coughs> Um, most significantly, calcium chloride, it has much more concentration of calcium glutamate, and then a calcium infusion is very helpful. However, they say that you should not give calcium infusions to patients who are on Juxin, while it's a contraindication. Um, atropine is helpful in these patients more so than it is in patient patients who have taken a visa blocker, um, and then vasopressors. Um, to obviously help bring up blood pressure and cardiac output, and then pacing if needed. A caveat with calcium channel blocks, and I think you've seen a few of them here, is that these patients will be profoundly hypotensive, actually more than patients with beta blocker toxicity. They will require multiple presses at once, and a lot of times, because calcium channel blockers have a long half-life, these patients require a lot of support for the first 24 or 48 hours, and then they have a very rapid recovery once the drug has been cleared the actual blood pressure will rebound up very quickly, they'll wake up and they actually do quite well, provided in the first 40 hours they are supported and nobody, um, we sometimes decide to make these patients comfort or palliative because they look so sick so quickly, but um, it's recommended that you hold on for 40 hours. Um, I think aspirin is the last one that I talk about and this is found in many over-the-counter toxic uh, medications. It's most toxic in oil form, which I've not ever actually seen, but obviously this comes as a tropical cream, as pills, as liquids, um, and it's usually co-ingested with other medications. Um, and chronic ingestion is worse than acute ingestion of this, and then the symptoms depend on whether they have mild, moderate, or severe toxicity, but it ranges from tinnitus all the way up to pulmonary edema and DIC. Uh, so I have a quick question. Does anybody know what the therapeutic dose of aspirin in adults should be? The bill. Therapeutic dose. Dose? 10 to 30. We have a 10 to 30 when we have taken. Uh, middle. Mm -hmm. Correct. 10 to 30. <laughs> so anything above 40 is actually a toxic dose and it should be treated. 
Um, and then there is a nomogram for aspirin, just like there is for Tylenol, but it does not predict toxicity, and so it really shouldn't be used clinically. Um, and then what is the most common acid-base disturbance in aspirin toxicity? B. 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 Uh, and I've seen this come up on board. So it's an anion gap metabolic acid. And that's because after you make the fully dry, so you uh, breathe faster, you breathe up the CO2, it inhibits the Krebs cycle, so you get uh, oxidative phosphorylation and lactic acid increase. Um, and it stimulates fatty acid metabolism and you get a as well. And the worse your acidosis is, the worse toxicity, and the more it will cross the blood brain barrier and you have neurological encephalitis. I think the reason is really yes, the last one. <laughs> so, uh, tricyclics, and I put this in because we, I've seen this also come up on board. Um, so, a death related to tricyclics is actually declining because now there's much newer antidepressants, antipsychotics, and SSRIs that need to be <coughs> They um, slow down the sodium influx into the heart, and so a lot of the problems with this is cardiac abnormalities and then you can also have seizures. Symptoms occur very early on, so within two to six hours of ingestion. And the serum level um, <coughs> confirm ingestion, but does not call it toxicity. So it varies from patient to patient. Most significantly in these patients, you want to have EKG monitoring this will cause a prolonged QRS. Um, and you want to give these patients bicarb to alkalize the urine. And you're aiming for a pH of 7.45 to 55. Uh, with a wide QRS. And you actually treat them with bicarb until their QRS narrows, not until you get them to a goal pH. Um, you can use activated charcoal, it doesn't have a great response, and you can gastric the them if you get them within one hour, which is generally unlikely. Um, a lot of these patients will go into TDP, Torsard, so you want to make sure you have plenty of magnesium. And then there's been some case studies where they've given patients hypertonic saline to overcome, um, uh, to help improve sodium influx and improve the cardiac contactivity. But again, um, that's kind of a working process. Um, I think we've talked about most of this stuff. Um, you can dialyze these patients if they have a level weight of 100 or they're having seizures or severe like that. Okay, so very, very quick recap, recap and we should be done. So which is the only directly toxic alcohol? Yes. <laughs> a normal osmol or gap cause no. out toxic ingestions. Pulse. Pulse. <coughs> Visual disturbances are specifically rich. Metanol. Huh? Metanol. Cool. <laughs> Renal failure associated with rich toxic ingestions. Ethylene. Right? Yes, ethylene. Ethylene. Yeah. That's a pain, potentially. Um, all our opioid receptors except oh, yeah. Omega. <laughs> During an opioid overdose, what percentage of patients develop aspiration? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. How long should you observe patients following the administration of And when administering glucagon, what is uh, contraindication? Yeah. And what is the contraindication for taxi and tissues? Correct. Okay. Done. Okay. 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 Okay.